In this video, we combine some of the most disturbing cave diving tragedies that happened in Europe that we've covered on this channel so far. From divers who got lost in the silt to divers who made a wrong turn and struggled to find their way out. If you enjoy watching these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories like these. Before we dive into the video, we'd like to share something with you guys. When away from home, I always connected to free Wi-Fi to check the news and watch my favorite Netflix shows. Take a moment to think about the fun things you do online. Watching our cave diving videos, shopping, mindlessly enjoying free Wi-Fi at the local cafe. You are probably not aware that cyber criminals can snatch your credit card info or hackers can easily steal your data and personal information. Lucky for us, we ran into today's video sponsor, NordVPN, which can secure your privacy with the fastest VPN on the planet. Go to nordvpn.com slash cave exploring or click on the link below for an exclusive deal. With four extra months and a 30-day money-back guarantee, it's worth trying because with just one click, you can virtually stay at home even when traveling or change the country to watch all new shows on Netflix that are restricted in your country. Right now, you can grab this special deal by diving to nordvpn.com slash caveexploring or via the link below. This offer includes four months extra for free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. This software is more than just a VPN. Another feature which has been really helpful is the password manager, NordPass, which accompanies you on a daily basis. It keeps your passwords handy even when you're offline to make your digital life easier and safer. So give this crazy deal a shot now and profit from the four months extra for free and a 30-day money-back guarantee. This is just the best deal you can get for the fastest VPN on the planet. You can grab this deal right now by going to nordvpn.com slash caveexploring or by clicking on the link in the description below. A passionate Polish diver went on a deep dive in Gould de Pont to break his depth record of 337 feet. He hit the water and gracefully dived deeper as he enjoyed the cave's beautiful scenery on his quest. Suddenly, every diver's worst nightmare struck him, and he got himself into big trouble. Gould Pont is located in Ardèche and Drôme, southwest France. It's situated within the boundaries of Bourg saint andéol and is found under a viaduct of the SNCF. The cave has a completely flooded system that is entered via a 10-13 to foot diameter walled-off pool. The cave is part of a hydrological system that drains water from the Remez Karat Plateau. Unforgettable diving may be found at this location with really intriguing rock formations. The water is exceptionally clear. The numerous curving passageways that occur in caves make it crucial to have a solid sense of direction. This is a location that is only accessible to technical divers due to the great depths. French explorers have reached as deep as 583 feet in this cave. In late December 2000, Vlodek Zimanowski, a 42-year-old caving enthusiast, was motivated by the sight of younger cave divers exploring sumps in the Polish Tatra Mountains. He resolved to learn cave diving himself and began taking steps to do so, including enrolling in a diving course and buying equipment. Despite the promise he made to his wife that he wouldn't take up cave diving, Vlodek joined a cave diving expedition in August 2001, led by a leading Polish cave diver, Viktor Bolek. The expedition took place in a resurgence in Romania, where he dove to a depth of 164 feet. He quickly became passionate about the sport and sought as much training as possible. Vlodek had a strong sense of self-motivation and disliked letting minor inconveniences prevent him from achieving his objectives. He liked the adversity and difficulty because they enhanced the sweetness of the eventual victory. Vlodek rose to prominence as one of Poland's top cave divers by 2005. Since his beginnings in August 2001, he has logged a sizable number of cave diving expeditions, both domestically and internationally and he has kept records of them in his Deep and High website. 
He traveled to the Picos in July 2002 as part of the OUCC Tormenta 2002 expedition, where he and Victor Bolek made an unsuccessful attempt to connect the C-4 sum and 27. He completed nearly 30 dives in 2003, with a maximum depth on his rebreather of 337 feet. Vlodek made at least three dives in 2004 that were within 100 meters of the bottom. His mentor and top-tier Polish cave diver, Viktor Bolek, tragically passed away in May 2004 while scuba diving in a flooded quarry, allegedly from natural causes. The research on Izbukal towels had been spearheaded by Viktor, and after Viktor's death, Vlodek took over, planning excursions in August and September 2004 and again in January 2005. On April 4, 2005, he traveled to the charming French town of bourg saint andéol with a small group led by another Vroclav cave diver. Given that French divers were already exploring the caves at bourg saint andéol this was very much on the tourist end of the spectrum. On April 5th at around 9 p.m., Flodek dived for around 80 minutes, reaching a maximum depth of 30 feet in what was almost certainly the Goule de la Tannerie cave. On one of his dive computers, this dive was captured. Flodek adored any sophistication in technology. His passion for taking risks and his interest in electronics were both legendary. The Goule de Pont, which lies a short distance from the Goule de la Tannerie, was the second cave that Flodek decided to explore. He considered this cave the perfect place to improve on his depth record of 337 feet, recorded back in 2003. On that April morning in 2005, as Vlodek got ready, the charming French town of bourg saint andéol certainly appeared like a fantastic place to be. He would utilize his well-known Buddy Inspiration rebreather apparatus for this dive and breathe a specific gas combination called Trimix that is designed for deep diving. An alternative to the conventional Jacques Cousteau style of diving equipment is the computer-controlled technical marvel known as the Buddy Inspiration. A rebreather can, given the correct conditions, enable a diver to prolong their underwater time and overall capabilities. His rebreather had experienced a few small dampness-related issues that morning as a result of leftover water from a little dive he had completed the previous evening, but it was nothing that ought to trouble him excessively or force him to cancel the dive. The dive the night before had also demonstrated that the apparatus was in good working order. So the Goule de Pont dive was anticipated. On April 6, 2005, shortly after 9.30 a.m., Flodek entered the sump pool of Goule de Pont and began to perform his pre-dive checks. He fastened two pre-submerged 10-liter cylinders, each weighing around 15 kilograms, to his harness. One of the cylinders was filled with a 1550 Trimix, and the other was a 40% Nitrox mix. If a rebreather fails underwater, the breathing regulator equipped cylinders are an essential safety backup. The Trimix cylinder was carried for emergency usage in the deeper parts of the cave, and the other containing a gas mixture for the shallower depths. Each may be utilized independently of the rebreather in an emergency. Flodex head dipped below the surface as he completed the long and tedious but necessary pre dive checks on his rebreather. At around 9.55 a.m., he was prepared to leave and he began his dive with a call-out time of 3 p.m. He was wearing a lot of cumbersome gear that wasn't made for caves, where space is usually limited. The back-mounted rebreather had a hard, yellow turtle-like shell that limited the height of the tunnel he could easily go through. The side-mounted safety cylinders also made it more difficult for him to maneuver through any confined locations. While using such a setup in open water poses no issues, doing so in smaller caverns can present issues. Fortunately, the Hulle de Palm is generally roomy and appropriate for the hefty equipment he was wearing, except for a brief shingle-filled constriction near the entry at a depth of 39 feet. Flodek had enough to do as he descended, in addition to taking in the surroundings of the cave channel. Monitoring the oxygen content of the gas he was breathing on a close monitoring basis was one of the most crucial jobs. The automated control system for the rebreather should, in principle, be able to manage the oxygen level with great precision, but computer control will always have its constraints and can experience problems. 
constant attention to the readings is required. The diver must adjust the volume of gas in the rebreather to balance the pressure of the breathing gas with the pressure of the surrounding water for each meter gained or lost in depth during the ascent. Breathing would soon become impossible without this easy task, which was a manual operation of Vlodek's equipment. Vlodek arrived at a rather horizontal passageway that immediately opens out after the shingle constriction. The water was, as expected, unusually clear that day and his helmet-mounted lights would have easily cut through the night to give him a clear view of the distant, gloomy horizon. Just 246 feet from the entrance, the cave tunnel abruptly switches directions and plunges headfirst into the depths at a depth of 59 feet. The cave's main struggle starts at this point. For those who have never dived before, following the passage down required more than just having Vlodek turn his body vertically while aiming his head downward. A diver must keep their body somewhat horizontal in the water, especially when utilizing the Buddy Inspiration Rebreather. The standard method for controlling a diver's descent and ascent is to adjust buoyancy, decrease buoyancy to descend, and increase buoyancy to rise. To descend, the diver deflates a buoyancy control device that is attached to him or her. Contradictory, filling the BCD with air will make it more buoyant and ascend the diver. The only issue is that as the diver descends, the water pressure gradually compresses the remaining air in the BCD, resulting in an equally gradual loss of buoyancy. If nothing else is done, this will cause the diver to descend at an ever-increasing rate until he or she hits the bottom. As depth increases, the diver must regularly infuse fresh air into the BCD to maintain a controlled rate of descent. The diver must pump more air into the BCD to stop the decline and achieve neutral buoyancy, but not very much or he will start going up. Flodek let out a small amount of air from his BCD to start the descent. Then he started to drift softly downhill. A sequence of vertical steps is present in the traditional phreatic-shaped tunnel throughout the following 197 feet of depth. Flodek likely started to encounter some unanticipated issues at some point during this section of the fall. The first was that, when he dropped below 164 feet, the effects of nitrogen narcosis presumably seemed to be harsher than he had anticipated. It is more likely that Vlodek would not have been deterred by what he may have considered simply a terrible day, because he didn't allow minor setbacks to stand in the way of a significant goal. The vertical staircase comes to an end and a horizontal gallery is reached at a depth of 259 feet. He pushed on along the gallery to the top of the spectacular 98-foot pitch. Despite the likelihood that he was suffering from nitrogen narcosis at this point and that breathing was incredibly challenging, his dive had turned extremely dangerous at this point. Although he was negatively affected by narcosis, which impaired his ability to analyze the situation and make critical decisions, Flodek was determined to proceed. He was strongly self-motivated, relished adversity and challenges, and made a decision to press on with a dive that would beat his depth record. Flodek proceeded along a horizontal gallery and used his buoyancy control device to maintain neutral buoyancy. To descend the pitch, he must vent off a small amount of air from the BCD to achieve negative buoyancy. As he descended, the effects of narcosis increased, affecting his ability to operate equipment and perceive the situation he was in. He must also regulate the gas pressure in his rebreather and control his rate of descent. The density of the gas also increases, making it harder to breathe and making the descent increasingly difficult. Instead of slowly drifting down the pitch in a relaxed and leisurely manner, he found he was having to work progressively harder simply to breathe. Whether Vlodek's rebreather was capable of handling exhaled carbon dioxide at extreme depths is currently in question, and he was likely breathing part of it back in. All things considered, with every meter he descended, his predicament grew more perilous. According to the minimal information given, what happened next can only be speculated. A possible explanation is that his capacity to control his buoyancy and presumably the gas pressure within his rebreather 
just became too difficult for him to manage in his more narcotic state at a depth of between 295 to 328 feet. He came to rest on a ledge at a depth of 344 feet as he fell downward out of control. He was probably only partially awake at this point, but the impact of hitting the ledge or his temporary inability to breathe may have briefly awakened him. He still had one trick left in his bag. He was able to switch from the main rebreather circuit and breathe straight from one of the device's smaller onboard cylinders, thanks to modifications to the rebreather. According to the logic, even if the rebreather had malfunctioned in any way, the onboard cylinder shouldn't have been impacted. The little cylinder had only theoretically enough gas to keep him breathing for 60 to 90 seconds, but that should be enough time for him to switch from the rebreather to the external emergency cylinder. Fortunately, after flipping the switch, he discovered that he could breathe again. Unfortunately, there wasn't much more he could do at this point. He lay there unable to move his attached emergency cylinder, which remained unattended, for reasons both physical and mental. This move was relatively easy, but necessary. The mouthpiece fell out of his mouth, and he drowned less than a minute after switching to the onboard cylinder. At 3 p.m., he had still not shown up as he had planned, so the surface party chose to see what could be done on their own. They made two dives to a maximum depth of 230 feet, but weren't able to find Vlodek. The rescue services were notified for what was, by this point, certain to be a body retrieval, because all reasonable hope had been lost. The following day, the French rescue team discovered Vlodek's body with his mouthpiece out of his mouth at a depth of 344 feet, towards the bottom of the 98-foot pitch, and started the gruesome process of extraction. The authorities started an investigation into what happened after his unfortunate death that occurred on French soil. The case's presiding examiner then requested an expert report from a knowledgeable French diver, which was delivered in November 2005. According to the analysis report, Vlodek drowned after the mouthpiece came out of his mouth. The diluent gas used in the dives was improperly prepared, which was the accident's primary cause. The report stated, during the descent, the diver had to breathe 1550 trimix from the beginning of the dive and to finish in the deep exploration on 1070 trimix. Indeed, this mixture, being the richest in helium, 70%, is only 20% nitrogen and should eliminate the problems of narcosis. Yet, if he follows this procedure, when at a depth of around 262 to 296 feet, he injects air instead of a 1550 trimix mixture, the narcotic effect of the nitrogen, nitrogen narcosis, is immediate. This can be explained by the idea that Vlodek should have utilized the gas as a diluent by connecting the 1550 trimix cylinder to an inflation point on his rebreather's counter lung. Instead, he switched from utilizing the external cylinder to using the internal diluent of the rebreather at a depth of about 262 to 296 feet. The narcotic effect of the new diluent on him was instant after he administered what he believed to be a 1070 trimix. Many have generally assumed that a fatal ending would have been caused by an unsuitable diluent and an unapproved CO2 absorbent, though. They don't appear to be able to comprehend how an experienced diver like Vlodek would have ended up in a deep cave using an air diluent. Could it be that Vlodek did not switch cylinders before diving the following day, but instead used the air diluent in the Goule de la Tannerie, where he had previously dived? For this to have happened, Vlodek would have needed to either have forgotten to swap the cylinders the following morning or thought the first day's dive was on Trimix. Nevertheless, the tragic event led to the loss of another passionate member of the diving community. The Berkwith Cave, known for its treacherous silty conditions, was chosen as the next exploratory dive site by Colin Pryor. The dangerous nature of this cave deterred many from diving there, and this left many parts of the cave less explored. Thirty years after the last exploration of this cave, Colin bravely decided to dive deeper into the unexplored portion of the cave that many experienced divers dreaded. The Horizontal Stream Cave, Berkwith Cave, is a component of the extensive network of related caves that surrounds Bentham in northern England. 
This system was notorious for its low visibility and constrained passageways. Amateur cave explorers can visit a few short sections of the cave, but only experienced divers can access the extensive underwater sections and subsequent above-water caves. The tiny constrained corridors in Berkwith Cave make it extremely challenging to navigate while wearing heavy diving gear. It also contains a lot of silt, which, if disturbed, might completely impair the vision of anyone plunging into the cave. Although more significantly, the previous divers had left a lot of slack rope lines around the cave to make it easier to navigate. The last successful exploration of the cave was carried out in the 1970s by diver Oliver Statham, who rated it as challenging, demanding, and dangerous. But almost 30 years later, a tragedy that was directly related to this dive occurred. Colin Pryor, a cave diver and explorer who was 29 years old, had been diving most of his life. At the age of 11, Colin started caving on the weekends with the scouts in Chandler's Ford, so he had a lot of experience. His courage and love for cave diving were unrivaled. He dove gallantly while others retreated in fear. He met Gemma Stone and fell in love while on one of his many excursions. While staying at the Yorkshire Subterranean Society School close to Ingleton, North Yorkshire, Gemma, another enthusiastic cave explorer, met Colin. As soon as they started dating, they clicked, and they went cave exploring together. The following several years saw Colin and Gemma traveling the globe and going on three or four monthly cave exploration dates. Until Colin and Gemma decided to go diving in the low Berkwith cave system, it therefore came as no surprise that he would wish to try this extraordinarily difficult task, which had only been tried by two other people. In his opinion, the cave system had not been thoroughly examined in more than 30 years, and many areas of it remained unexplored. When the specified day finally arrived, Colin was inspired to accomplish this groundbreaking feat in the dangerous world of cave diving. Colin went to the dive site unafraid of the risks and set up ropes and lines to help him carry his equipment into the cave and to the area where he would enter the water. With Gemma's assistance, he prepared for the exploration and was then prepared to dive. However, two things happened that made them postpone the dive. There was bad weather, and Colin received the unfortunate news that Stuart Anderson, a friend, had become trapped in a cave while exploring and required rescue. Colin and Gemma had to halt their intended dive at the Low Berkwith Cave to rescue Stuart, but as a result, he missed his chance to go diving. Here's the thing. Just like in the case of Stuart, cave diving can be quite dangerous, so even a perfect dive can take a wild turn. Some are not lucky enough to make it out alive, which is why many consider cave diving an extreme sport. For this purpose, there are some precautions divers are trained and educated on. This is to help them have a greater chance of survival in the deep. One such thing is the use of guidelines. Divers use guidelines to ensure their safety and navigate through underwater environments. It helps them prevent from getting lost in unfamiliar areas, conserve their air supply, and facilitate necessary decompression stops. Following a guideline can also improve their visibility underwater by minimizing disturbances to sand and silt. In addition, using a guideline marks a safe entry and exit point and reduces the risk of getting tangled in underwater obstacles. The other important safety precaution is the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds is a diving principle where divers use one third of their air supply for the descent and exploration, another third for the return journey, and the remaining third as a reserve in case of an emergency. It helps divers plan for the unexpected and ensures they have enough air to safely explore the underwater world. Following the rule of thirds is a crucial safety measure for divers. Although in some unfortunate situations, divers follow these rules and end up dead due to some other reason. On March 13th, Colin called Gemma and informed her that he would be leaving for a solo dive at 3.30 p.m. Gemma was unable to accompany Colin to the dive because of work obligations that day. Colin entered the cave through the entrance, carrying the dive gear he would require. He put together his dive equipment by himself, making sure to check his pressure gauge, regulator, and emergency regulator for any faults that would affect his dive. 
He was ready to become one of the first people to ever explore the enormous cave system beyond its known depth. Everything was operating flawlessly, and he started his dive by plunging into the water. He periodically checked his pressure gauge as he made his way through the winding passageways to make sure he had enough air to go back out of the system and have extra in case something went wrong. After more than 30 years, in the 1970s, when renowned diver Oliver Statham last investigated the cave, Colin came across an old guideline that had been left there. He persisted and finally entered uncharted territory, which indicates that he had penetrated areas of the cave system that had not yet been studied by anyone on Earth. He was essentially the first person in human history to go that far into the cave. After some time, Colin observed that his pressure gauge had dropped to two-thirds of an inch of air, which gave him the warning to start diving out to the exit, according to the rule of thirds. This rule states that divers leave one-third of their tank in reserve, as we've already mentioned, in the unlikely event that something should prevent them from emerging from the water. He returned to the surface by following the plan he had laid out. He was the only human still alive who had gone that far into the caves. An outstanding feat that requires a high amount of talent, bravery, and dedication. Suddenly, Colin felt a tug on his tank around halfway through his ascent toward the cave's entrance. He continued to swim forward until he felt another tug, which alerted him to the fact that he was caught in an old guideline that had been abandoned more than 30 years earlier. Colin pulled out his knife and started cutting the line on his own, without the help of any other divers. He attempted to free it again, but it remained stuck. Since Gemma, Colin's girlfriend, was at work when the dive happened, she awaited his call at 3.30, but it never arrived. She then called to report the situation, but before the emergency operators got there, the rescue mission turned into a recovery. This was because he was found more than seven hours after Gemma made the call, and that was a substantial amount of time. Colin was discovered dead in a flooded passageway, 500 feet below the surface, with his corpse completely entangled in ropes and his tanks empty. A group of rescue divers who had all known Colin personally or were his friends participated in the recovery effort. Colin had sacrificed his life to advance discovery, human knowledge, and comprehension. This was a sad incident, especially for a seasoned diver who followed the rules. Since he was diving alone, nobody was aware of the specifics of what occurred, but Colin would have followed all necessary safety measures. So what brought about this catastrophe? He should have been able to use his knife to cut himself free. The only known information about his passing is that he was discovered to have drowned after getting entangled in ropes. Whatever the case, there are a few plausible possibilities that can explain what might have occurred. This could have happened because he was tangled. He might have become caught between the tank and the emergency regulator, BCD inflator hose, and pressure gauge behind the head. It would be extremely challenging if not impossible, to remove or cut free if this section were to become tangled in the ropes. Imagine attempting to use a razor-sharp knife while entirely blind to cut the ropes that were well behind his neck. It explores perilous and tough terrain. It proves difficult and risky. Also, it is highly probable that due to the cave's potential to be silted up easily, Colin had a brush up against the side of the cave, which would result in low visibility for him. This blinding situation, coupled with being tangled and trying to cut a rope he can't see loose, would have disoriented him until his tank was empty. Whatever the situation may have been, this unfortunate incident cost the world a skilled adventurer and his family a beloved man. Plura Cave, Norway is a popular diving site among experienced cave divers. The waters are ice cold, but the views are stunning. In 2014, a horrible accident happened to a group of five Finnish divers while traversing the Plura Cave system. Stay till the end to find out what happened to them. On February 6, 2014, a group of five divers planned to traverse the Plura Cave system. The five divers were 46-year-old Kai Kankinen, 42-year-old Patrick Gronkvist, 40-year-old Yadi Hutaranen, 33-year-old Vesa Rantanen, 
and 34-year-old Yari Yu. All five divers were experienced technical divers with CCR full cave dive certification. Four of the divers, except Yari Yu, had dived in the Plura Cave in the past, so they weren't new to the cave. But Yari Yu had dived several times into the quarries and caves of Finland and other places. They planned to enter the Plura Cave in a pond and dive 6,680 feet to the other entrance, which is at the Steinugel Flagget Cave. The Plura Cave, or Plura Grata, is located in Rana, Norway. With a depth of at least 443 feet, it's the deepest cave in Northern Europe. Because of its great visibility, reaching up 66 feet, the cave is very popular among cave divers. The passages of the cave were formed by the current of the Plura River over limestone. This exploration can be very dangerous and complicated because of the ice-cold water and narrow passages. Divers can easily get lost in its side passages. On February 6, 2014, very early in the morning, the five divers were ready to start their dive. They divided themselves into two groups, Kai, Vesa, and Yari Yu in one group, and Patrick and Yari H in another group. Patrick and Yari began to cut holes in the ice with chainsaws at the entrance of the cave, while the other three took their diving equipment to Steinugelflaget Cave. Yari H and Patrick were the first to dive inside the cave, making their way through the hole they had just drilled in the ice at the pond area. The temperature of the water under the ice was 2 degrees Celsius, and it was crystal clear. The second group planned to enter the cave two hours after the first group started their dive to ensure that any disturbances caused by their movements had settled down before they started their dive. While the second group waited at the entrance, Yadi and Patrick continued their dive into the cave using an underwater scooter to hasten their movements and conserve their energy. They both had a closed-circuit rebreather and a bailout. The closed-circuit rebreather was used because it recycles exhaled oxygen. This helps to conserve oxygen and it extends their diving time, which was necessary because they planned to dive for around five hours. They also had secondary equipment, another rebreather system and open-circuit gas cylinders in case their primary equipment failed. After two hours, the second group, Kai, Vesa, and Yadi Yu, began their dive, passing through the same pond as the first group. Patrick and Yadi came very close to the deepest part of the cave, which is 427 feet. They released their underwater scooter so that Yadi could take a look at the beauty of the cave, being this was his first time at Plura Cave. Yadi tried talking to Patrick, but though he shouted, Patrick couldn't hear him because of his mouthpiece. They were much closer to the entrance at Steinugelflaget Cave than to the pond entrance where they were coming from. Patrick switched to his bailout rebreather successfully as he journeyed first through the right turn and ascending narrow passage that leads to their destination. By the time he was done with the ascent, he discovered he couldn't see Yachty's light. He turned around and waited for a while just to see Yachty's light waving up and down. Although he didn't know what was wrong with Yachty, he immediately knew this was a sign of distress. Yachty was calling Patrick to come to him, and Patrick did. Both of them were now facing each other in the narrow cave, and Patrick had to remove one of his large bailout cylinders and his scooter that was almost blocking the way at the request of Yachty. When Patrick got to Yadi, he discovered that Yadi's scooter line was stuck under a giant rock. When Patrick told him his scooter was stuck, Yadi forcefully removed it from the rock. Patrick stepped out of the way for Yadi to pass, but Yadi was rather asking for an open circuit bailout gas. This was the moment Patrick knew that Yadi was really in great distress. They were now about 364 feet below the surface. Yadi received the open circuit bailout and he took some breaths from it before switching back to his rebreather. Yadi repeated this about three times. Later, Patrick discovered that Yadi did not have anything in his mouth again, so he helped him put a regulator over his mouth as he pressed the purge button. The purge button on the front of the regulator injects a blast of air for clearing instead of using your own breath. Patrick intended to help Yadi out, but it turned out to worsen the situation. Yadi inhaled water and eventually gave up the ghost. With great fear, Patrick immediately held on to a nearby rock while trying to get himself together. His heart was already racing at the sight of his friend's corpse. Being a rescue diver, Patrick has seen several dead bodies but watching his dead friend was traumatic for him. 
Nevertheless, he had to calm himself so that two fatalities wouldn't be recorded. Panic in the face of cave diving difficulties kills faster than anything else. Patrick couldn't return to meet the second group to inform them that they had already had a casualty because the passage had been blocked by Yadi's body. Also, he couldn't go for a quick decompression to exit the cave as fast as possible without having to face decompression sickness, which could have endangered his life in the end. Their five-hour planned dive was going to last him about eight to nine hours. He had already given some of his bailouts to Yachty, and the oxygen cylinder was also with Yachty. He had no option but to continue his dive towards Steinugelflaget Cave, hoping to get out before he ran out of gas. He wondered how his other friends would react when they discovered Yachty's body by the time they arrived at the scene. He was baffled if they would also successfully make it out of the cave, and if he wouldn't be the only surviving diver on this trip. The second group, led by Vesa, who had a video camera attached to his diving scooter, had yet to reach the scene where Patrick and his dead diving buddy were. The three divers in the group, Vesa, Kai, and Yadi Yu, carried enough bailout cylinders, and Vesa, who was super conscious of having failed primary equipment, carried along five big cylinders with him. His friends had warned him against this action because his movement would be restricted in the cave's narrow passages, but he would not listen. Kai then offered to assist with one of those cylinders. At about 410 feet into the cave, Vesa got stuck in a very narrow passage. Therefore, he took off two of his cylinders so that he could pass through the narrow passage. Again, one of his fins became tangled with the guideline, and he shouted at the person behind him, Yadi Yu, to help him remove it. After he was out of the entanglements, he realized that his diving time had increased because of the initial delay. This means that he would have to perform several decompression stops in cold water, which he disliked. Vesa continued his dive into the deepest part of the cave. Then he discovered Yachty's body. He didn't look into the body, but maneuvered his way around it to pass. When he noticed that a light was closer to him, Yachty's light, he shouted that Yachty H was dead, but he would try to find a way to pass. Kai, who was some distance behind them, met Yachty Yu, and he discovered that something was off with him. He asked Yachty what was wrong, but he couldn't understand what he said. Yachty Yu was moving up and down. Possibly he had seen the body of Yachty H and decided to turn back. At some point, he switched to his bailout system and stopped using the closed circuit rebreather. Kai tried to tell him to take it easy so that he could ensure his equipment was working effectively. Kai didn't know what was wrong, but he believed that Yachty Yu wasn't having issues with his rebreather. Not long afterwards, Yachty Yu also dropped dead. When Kai saw that Yachty Yu was dead, he had no option but to continue with his journey. There was nothing he could do for his dead friend. As he dove a bit past the body of Yachty Yu, he saw the body of Yachty H and teamed up with Vesa, who was kicking violently to get past Yachty's body. Then Kai shouted to inform Vesa that Yachty Yu was also dead and that they should turn back. But Vesa didn't turn back because of the long distance it would take them to return to the pond entrance where they had come from. Kai turned back alone, not being able to wait for Vesa, whom he assumed might not make it through the rigors alive because he was already panicking and would get exhausted sooner. Also, he never knew what the fate of Patrick would be, dead or alive, but ultimately, he thought he too would have died. But luckily for Vesa, he was able to get through the narrow passage after removing some of his equipment. Kai had a long ascent to make. He had two rebreathers with him, but he was left with little extra air. One of his bailout cylinders, which was only fitted for deep diving, couldn't be used for his ascent. Kai had no options but to make a fast ascent, ignoring several warnings from his dive computer indicating his need for decompression stops. His chances of running out of gas were greater than having decompression sickness. On getting to the air chamber, which is just about 98 feet away from the entrance, Kai decided to breathe air from it while conserving his air. But he couldn't wait too long, wondering how many days he would need to spend in the air chamber, with no one available to rescue him if anything went wrong with him there. He had to move on and continue his journey to the entrance. His situation got even worse because his underwater scooter broke down. This resulted in more delay, as he still had to maneuver his way to the entrance if he didn't want to die in the cave. The trip from the air chamber to the entrance took 45 minutes without his scooter, instead of 15 minutes. 
Meanwhile, Patrick was in great despair while he was heading towards the entrance of Steinigl Flaga Cave after the death of his diving buddy. He never knew what had happened to the rest of his friends. He thought about his family. What could he have done alone in the dark, cold water late at night? He held on to the rocks as he continued his dive. He had limited battery power left for his scooter, but he needed to stay warm and have light around him. But he can only go for one of these options at a time. Either he stays warm and is in the dark, or he stays cold and has light. It was a tough time for him. Patrick never knew that Vesa was behind him, having his decompression stop. He never thought any of them had made it alive. Vesa remained close to the guideline, and he often laid on the cave's floor while waiting during his decompression stop. Luckily for him, his new undersuit had enough argon to inflate it, and with this, he was able to maintain his body temperature. Kai, who was making his ascent through the same entrance they entered the cave through, took some decompression stops, but he skipped many. He also dropped some of his equipment and fixed him on the guideline. He was getting colder whenever he made a stop, so he swam around to keep himself warm. He felt guilty for not being able to help his friend Yadi Yu. He thought about the fate of Patrick too, but he had no one to answer his questions as to what had happened to his other two friends. After several hours, he opened the valve of his last oxygen tank, though unaware of the quantity left. All alone, the three divers were making their way out to the entrance. They had spent more hours than they had planned, so they were all running out of air and strength in themselves. They had to seriously miss a lot of decompression stops to save time and air. While Patrick continued his dive to the Steinugelflage cave entrance, he noticed a light directly below him as he made his ascent. He soon realized that it was Vesa who was coming below him. Vesa informed him that the others had turned back. This gave Patrick a bit of relief as he continued his journey out of the cave. It was around 9 o'clock in the evening when Patrick got to the surface. He had spent eight and a half hours instead of five in the cave. He sat down in the Steinigelflaget cave, waiting for Vesa to exit through the same entrance. After about an hour, Vesa also emerged from the cave. He was already experiencing headaches from the cave, which he mistook for decompression sickness. When he got to the surface, he was also having aches in his right knee. They both sat down to relax at the Steinigelflaget cave. After three hours, Kai also surfaced at the other entrance to the pond, where they had all entered the cave. A thin layer of ice covered the hole they initially drilled while entering, but he was able to break through it and come out. On getting to the surface, he could find no one around. It was already 1.30 a.m. on February 7, 2014, and everywhere was still dark. He had dived for nothing less than 11 and a half hours. The dive that started on February 6 ended some hours into the following day. He went into the van that brought them to the dive site. He switched on the engine and turned on the lights too. Patrick and Vesa changed into dry clothes at Steinugelflaget Cave and walked up to the pond at Jordbru Farm to wait there. They alerted the Norwegian authorities about the incident. While waiting, they saw the van's lights on at around 2 a.m., and both of them ran to the van to see who it was. Kai, who was laying down in the van, thought they were people from the neighborhood. He told them in English that he would never swim again. He never thought Patrick and Vesa had made it out of the cave. News spread abroad about two Finnish divers who died in Plura Cave. Police officers came to the scene and investigated the incident with Kai, Patrick, and Vesa. Vesa was taken to a decompression chamber in Bergen, Norway. Three British divers were later summoned by the local authorities to help recover the two bodies. They entered the cave through the Steinugelflaget entrance, but they couldn't bring the bodies out, seeing that the recovery operation would be too dangerous. The cave was later closed and banned from further adventure by the officials since they couldn't recover the bodies. Patrick, Kai, and Vesa were distraught when they heard the officials and international divers weren't able to recover the bodies of their friends. They decided to recover the bodies from the cave themselves because they owed it to them. After all, they did know the cave better than anyone else. They started to plan the recovery operation, despite the official ban. At some point, Patrick sent messages to some of his diving buddies, asking for their help in the recovery operation of his friend's bodies. They were all eager to help him out. Kai was also ready to join the recovery operation. Although Vesa was banned from diving due to a spinal injury caused by his decompression sickness that affected his walking and reflexes, he also volunteered. He served as a surface manager of the operation. 
They all made comprehensive preparations for the recovery, but that was kept secret from the authorities. Patrick was performing the recovery dive with Sammy Pakaranen, who was the third of the trio besides Patrick and Kai that had originally discovered the connecting caverns between Plura and Steinigel Flogged Caves. The recovery operation ultimately became successful as they were able to recover the bodies. However, Sammy almost died as the cave collapsed during the operation. He was almost crushed by a large falling boulder, which he captured on film. They reported to the authorities that they had recovered the bodies the following day. Although the operation was illegal, none of them were charged with any crime, so the bodies could be taken out of the cave. About two months and three weeks after the incident, the two bodies were brought out of the cave and taken to Finland for a proper funeral. The three surviving friends, Kai, Patrick, and Vesa, all went to the funeral service of their friends, Yari Hutaradan and Yari Yu. In 2017, a Spanish cave diver got trapped inside an air pocket in a dark underwater cave at the Cova de Sapiqueta in Manacor, Spain. His diving buddy tried to find his way out of the cave without a guideline to call for help. Would this turn out to be yet another tragic moment? Or would a rescue be successful? This is the story of Shisco Gracia. During exploration in 2012, an almost invisible surface current was detected in the only yet to be explored pool at the western side of the Cova de Sapiqueta. Some cave divers decided to return to further explore the cave. They spent more than 55 days on this endeavor. Several new chambers were discovered with a total length of 18,307 feet. The Cova de Sapiqueta is now 28,215 feet long, of which 20,498 feet are underwater. The cave has six systems altogether. The Cove del Parata sector and the Cove de Pont sector share the same underwater connection, and the other four form a single interconnected underwater zone, which is altogether 18,701 feet of development and an area of about 38,230 square meters. Shisco Gracia is a 54-year-old Spanish man and the father of two children, a boy of 15 years and a girl of 9 years. He's a geology teacher in Mallorca, Spain. He spends most of his weekends doing what he loves, cave diving. Exploring and mapping the underwater cave complexes on the island of Spain are the most enjoyable moments for him. On April 15, 2017, Shisco Gracia and his friend Guillaume Mascaro went for exploration at the Cova de Sapiqueta in Manacor, Spain. The two friends dove into the water for about 60 minutes before getting to a network of underwater caves. When they got into the cave, Shisco collected different samples of rock for a few minutes. Guillaume, on the other hand, was busy charting a nearby chamber. Everything was going smoothly all through their journey into the cave and their research time in the cave. Their misery began when they were about to return to the surface. Within a few minutes, every circumstance within the cave was just against them. The two of them, who had already gone separate ways for their various activities, met unexpectedly at a junction in the cave. They both had stirred up silt from the bottom of the cave, turning the water into total murkiness and thereby reducing the visibility to zero. They could no longer see each other, as if that wasn't enough. They wanted to blindly find a way out of the cave, only to find out that their nylon wire guideline had broken. Every diver knows that even if you cannot see what is before you, with a guideline, you can still figure your way out of a complex cave system. But here are Shisko and Guillaume, both in a dark cave with broken guidelines. How would they get out? They resolved to search for the guideline and connect the two broken ends again. The plan time within the cave was extended because of the search, and before they knew it, they were already running out of gas in their cylinders, and their emergency supplies were almost gone too. To save themselves from the possibility of running out of air completely in the dark cave, they went to stay in an air pocket that was very close to them. They both knew that the remaining gas could not take the two of them out of the cave. So Shisko decided to stay in the air pocket while Guillaume would go out to call for help since he was not as chubby as his friend. He would use less air for breathing 
and Shisko was also more experienced in breathing higher levels of carbon dioxide, which is the component of air in the cave. Guillem didn't want to leave his friend alone in the cave, but both are only faced with two options. Either they die together in the cave, or he goes and calls for help. Shisko sat on a flat rock above the water surface to take some rest, as Guillem started his journey toward the exit without a guideline. The chamber of the cave was about 260 feet long and 65 feet wide, and the height between the water and the roof of the cave is about 40 feet. Gracia was sitting alone in the dark cave with the expectation of rescuers coming for him anytime soon. Out of his three flashlights, only one was left working, so he had to switch it off to conserve the battery. Several thoughts flipped through his mind as he wondered why he had to experience this condition after spending so many years diving. But he kept hope alive, but that was just for seven to eight hours after Guillaume had left, thinking he must have reached the surface. As time passed and there was no sound, Shisko gave up hope of survival. He thought his friend must have gotten lost and died in the cave, and no one would ever know he was down there at the bottom of the lake. Experiences cannot override the effect of breathing in high levels of carbon dioxide for Shisko. He had the experience of staying in this condition, but after several hours, his body began to react to the strange air in his system. The carbon dioxide was about a hundred times higher than that above ground. That's too much to bear for the body's system. He began to suffer from a headache. His brain was worrying, and he couldn't even catch a nap. He was exhausted from a lack of oxygen. Hope arose for Shisko in his new dark abode as he began to hear the sound of bubbles from a diver emerging and also saw some lights in the lake. But little did he know that he was hallucinating. When he turned his head, they weren't real. Those hours seemed like days to him. He continued to wait for a rescue. Possibly his friend could have made it out, but he wasn't sure. Then another sound came from above him this time. It was louder than the first. It was like the sound of cylinders being filled with air for the rescue team. Later, he saw that it looked like they were drilling through the rock. Joy sprang up in him as his hope for living was restored, and he thought within himself that they had come to rescue him. But the joy soon faded away as the noise he was formerly hearing subsided. No more noise. No more rescues. Another hallucination. He thought of stabbing himself with his knife, but before he could injure himself, he heard the noise again. The sound of bubbles and a diver's light was becoming brighter and getting closer. Is this going to be another hallucination for Shisko or a reality for escaping the death that had held on tight to him? The answer came to him with the emergence of a diver's helmet that showed up from the water. Then he knew this was real and that he was no longer in an unreal world. The rescue team is around, but the poor visibility within the cave had greatly hindered them from swimming to his location. So they thought of drilling a hole to pass food and oxygen to him, but that wasn't successful. So they sent some rescuers searching for him. But fortunately, Bernat Clammer was the first to find him. When he got a glimpse of Bernat, who happened to be his longtime friend, he jumped into the water to hug him. Bernat asked him about his welfare and said he had been afraid, thinking he had lost him to the cold hand of death. Bernat still had to return to the rest of the team and tell them that Shisko had been found. Shisko now had the assurance of getting out of the cave within the next eight hours. These hours would be his happiest moments since he was left alone in the cave. A cylinder with air enriched with oxygen was handed over to him for breathing. The rescue team led him out of the cave slowly. He got out of the cave late on the night of the third day, 60 hours after he initially entered the cave with his friend. At the surface was his friend Guillaume, who had gone back for help. The two embraced each other, and within a short time, Shisko was taken off in an ambulance. The temperature of his body was close to hypothermia, at 31 degrees Celsius. He was given pure oxygen to breathe overnight. He stayed calm until he saw the TV show of his rescue the following day. He only stayed home for a month before returning to the Sapiqueta Caves for further exploration. He couldn't just forfeit his hobby because of his narrow escape. He had spent 24 years exploring the world below water, and that was already induced into his bloodstream. 
He will always return there, no matter what. Simon Halliday, a passionate and experienced cave diver, decided to go on another dive in the Lancaster Hole on the 4th of January 2020. Although he was with his two friends, he chose to go on a solo dive this time around, and he was expected to have been done in three hours, but he never surfaced. What happened to Simon? Did the rescue team find him on time? Stay tuned. One of England's greatest limestone cave networks, which extends beneath Cumbria, Lancashire, and the Yorkshire Dales, is based near Lancaster Hole, which also serves as a portal to the three-county system. George Connors and Bill Taylor found the hole in September 1946. It's located in Cumbria. Everybody is welcome to explore the cave at any time of the year, but you must reserve your spot in advance. The hole was well liked. The surprisingly unassuming entrance to Lancaster Hole is a manhole cover. Below, the pothole's main shaft opens up, allowing skilled potholers access to the world-famous Easegill Caverns and Three Counties Cave System. Simon Halliday was a remarkable individual who left a lasting impression on those who knew him. He was a loving husband and a devoted father of two, and his family was the center of his world. Simon was born and raised in the charming town of Clitheroe, where he spent most of his life. He was a hard-working and dedicated individual who excelled in everything he set his mind to. He had a natural talent for the sport and quickly became one of the most skilled cave divers in the country. Simon's passion for diving led him to explore some of the most challenging and remote cave systems around the world. He had a particular fascination for exploring underwater caves, which required a unique set of skills and equipment. After taking a break from diving for two years, Simon decided to pick up the sport again while on holiday in Egypt. It was during this trip that he received his dive qualification, which opened a whole new world of possibilities for him. Simon was determined to push the limits of what was possible in cave diving and went on to accomplish many things that others could only dream of. Simon was an active member of the Northern Division of the Cave Diving Group, CDG, a community of passionate and dedicated cave divers. He was respected and admired by his fellow divers, who regarded him as one of the very best. Simon was known for his tenacity and unwavering commitment to his goals. He was always the strongest member of the team and never shied away from a challenge. Despite his impressive accomplishments, Simon remained humble and approachable. He was always willing to share his knowledge and expertise with others and was a source of inspiration for many aspiring cave divers. Simon's infectious enthusiasm and positive attitude were contagious, and he had a way of making everyone around him feel energized and motivated. Simon Halliday entered the running club Clayton Lamore's Harriers in January 2004. He was already a skilled and knowledgeable caver at this point, but he wanted to improve his stamina and fitness because he called himself the Fat Caver and was frequently seen at the bar. He was constantly looking for and eager to meet the next challenge. He excelled at it just as he had done his entire life and went on to compete in some of the toughest fell races as a renowned fell runner. On January 4, 2020, Simon Halliday, along with his two friends David McDonough and Kevin Gannon, visited Lancaster Hole, a cave system in Lancashire, England. Simon was an experienced cave diver who had explored this system before, and he planned to undertake a solo dive that would take no more than three hours. However, on that particular day, there was an unusually high amount of water flowing into the channel, which made the dive more challenging than usual. Despite the adverse conditions, Simon decided to proceed with the dive, determined to complete the challenge he had set for himself. He was wearing a rebreather, which was allegedly still in development and not yet ready for purchase. The device was provided to him by Sump UK, a sporting goods company specifically for this dive. A rebreather is an underwater breathing device that captures carbon dioxide from a diver's exhaled breath, allowing them to recycle the significantly lost oxygen content. The following was the final post Simon ever made on his social media account. Just setting off now, 
I'll be underground all day. We'll post something later. These words would be etched in the minds of his loved ones forever. As Simon descended into the depths of the cave, he encountered a series of challenges that he had not anticipated. The water flow was stronger than he had expected, and he had to exert more effort to make progress. Despite this, Simon remained calm and focused, relying on his years of experience and training to navigate through the cave. After Simon left, his friends waited for four hours before becoming concerned. They knew that Simon could have lost track of time or encountered unexpected difficulties, but they also knew that he was one of the best in the business. Therefore, they decided to stay an extra hour, hoping that he would show up. However, as the hours passed, their anxiety began to grow, and they eventually decided to contact the authorities. The Cumbria police were informed of Simon's disappearance, and a rescue group for caves was immediately dispatched to the site. The group consisted of up to 40 members who were all experienced divers and had undergone rigorous training for such situations. They knew the dangers of cave diving and were well equipped to handle any challenges they might face. They began their search at the spot where the cave divers entered the downstream route of Lancaster Hole. In case the cave diver had exited one of the systems somewhere else, the team members and cave divers also examined other entrances and potential exits. Sadly, the rescue diver found Simon about 196 feet down the sump while doing the underwater search. This was just after 14 minutes. Simon's oxygen supply pipe appeared to have been severed or ripped out when he was pulled from the water. Although it was unclear if this occurred during the dive or after the recovery, Anthony Seddon was the diver who discovered Simon's body. The casualty was retrieved from the water and brought back to the sump pool chamber, where it was immediately determined that he had passed away. The subsequent lengthy and challenging extraction back to Fell's surface involved all team members. The victim was then taken to Ballpot Farm and placed in Cumbria Police's custody. Uncertainty surrounds the tragedy's actual details. As we said previously, there was a greater than usual flow of water into the tunnel. Although Simon did not consider this to be a problem, it seemed that during his time in the hole, the water current's intensity grew. This could have made him use more air on his return trip when he would have been fighting the current. If Simon had been under stress and had to breathe more heavily because his air was running out, this issue might have gotten worse. He may have needed to exert extra effort to stay down in the passage and prevent drifting towards the roof due to the increase in buoyancy that came with the emptying of his canisters. Simon's dive computer's inquest data also supported the idea that he had shifted to his bailout option once his rebreathing apparatus failed. Since he was utilizing an experimental, not yet commercially available rebreather made by Andy Goring at Sump UK, the equipment used a straight fitting into the rebreather, according to rescue diver Jason Mallinson. If such were the case, the fitting would not have unscrewed, according to him, because it has an elbow fitting with a 90-degree bend. As a result, Simon was in a race against time when his rebreather failed, stated Dr. Nicholas Shaw, assistant coroner for Cumbria. He was close to the surface when he died. Dr. Shaw classified the incident as a misadventure and listed drowning as the official cause of death. Simon left a wife and two kids behind. Simon reportedly led a lusty life and made the most of each day, according to his wife. He was a devoted husband and father, and the incident had broken both of their hearts deeply. The numerous comments on the Pegasus Diving Club's memorial to Simon Halliday show how much of an influence he had on people's lives. Malcolm Scothan, one of Simon's pals, gave the following posts on the Pegasus Diving Club website. I first met Simon shortly after I had qualified as an open water diver. Pegasus had arranged an altitude dive at Hodge Close, and whilst I was excited about the trip, I was also feeling apprehensive. Simon, in his confident and friendly manner, stepped in and talked me through the dive and immediately put me at ease. He was forever looking to push and explore. More recently, I was privileged to work with him on a couple of the club's projects. 
Simon, as always the driving force, ensured we achieved the day's aim in a hands-on, professional way. A sad loss. Simon will be sorely missed, and I would like to think he's now somewhere special, pushing his caving and diving explorations. My thoughts are with his family. It was an unfortunate incident for Simon, who was a dedicated, focused, and professional person. He had always set out to be the best at everything he did. A person who left a huge vacuum in the caving, diving, and friendship communities, and was known for constantly pushing the frontiers of exploration. This was the seventh cave diving marathon on this channel, and the second Europe episode. Let us know what you think in the comments section. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.